doctors started telling me these uh, stories about uh, drugs and therapies that they were prescribing, um, and they were shocked, they were horrified, because they find out that these therapies, one after another, were actually causing more harm than good. And um, they wanted to know how it happened. Uh, they couldn't believe that they were giving medicines to people um, that were actually, in some instances, killing patients. In general, um, the main character's experience is closely based on my own experience, and I worked for the industry for about 10 years. There are over 80,000 pharmaceutical salespeople employed by the drug industry in the United States alone. Uh, my understanding is that's about one for every four doctors. Uh, their job is to sell drugs. They are, their job is not to educate doctors. Their job is not to um, provide medical information. They have one job and one job only, to push their product particularly against other competing products. I don't think any of us, if we wanted, decided we wanted to buy a new car, would say, well, it's really hard to go out and search and learn everything about all the new cars, so I'm going to go to the, deal, the maker of a given car and ask them, is it a good car? We would understand that we really couldn't trust what that person told us, and that that wouldn't be better than no information. In fact, in some ways, it would be worse than no information. Let's be honest, they're there to sell their drug, they're not there to educate doctors. They get paid, they get bonuses on how much drugs the doctor prescribes, not whether the doctor is prescribing uh, the most appropriate drugs. So I don't think any doctor would get their information from reps if it wasn't for that the information came with free food and other sorts of perks. If you took away all that stuff, uh, in the 21st century I don't think too many doctors would be getting their information from reps. Before 1980, most clinical research was uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health. Academic researchers, quote, snubbed their noses at, commercially, at doing commercially funded research. When President Reagan came into office, the economy was slow, the ethos was small government, and the NIH funding of clinical studies uh, went down dramatically. The drug companies were very happy to come in and lend a helping hand. Nothing much changed until 1991, uh, because the studies were still being done in universities. But during the 90s, most of that research got pulled out of universities and uh, was, being done, was brought to uh, for-profit research organizations. Now, nothing inherently unethical about that. It was more efficient and quicker uh, for the drug companies. The problem is that that gave virtual complete control over the research to the drug companies. They could design the studies. They have control of the data so that ma many of the authors of the most important articles uh, published in our best journals aren't even allowed to see their own data. The data are so hidden and so complex, whether it's gene therapy or whether it's the number of people who die of heart attacks while taking Vioxx, uh, we have to rely on researchers to provide us with that evidence. And um, I think the most shocking thing is to find that that evidence is simply not available or it is distorted. And some of it is hidden um, as trade secrets. Federal trade secrets laws, commercial interests, allow drug companies um, to withhold some of this information. And I just recently found out, for example, that the Food and Drug Administration does not report all the deaths it knows about uh, in patients who are on certain drugs because these are considered federal trade secrets. The data that I found on the FDA's website showed for Vioxx that in the company's own study, in Merck's own study called the Vigor study, uh, where Vioxx was compared to naproxen or Aleve sold over the counter, um, Vioxx is no more effective than Aleve, but the important thing is that the manufacturer's own data shows that Vioxx causes significantly more cardiovascular complications, heart attacks, blood clots, and strokes, more than Aleve. And overall, Vioxx is a more dangerous drug than Aleve. So that if I, as a family doctor, prescribed Vioxx for 100 patients in a row, within the next year, there would be two and a half serious complications because I treated those patients with Vioxx instead of Aleve. The New England Journal of Medicine article that was published in November of 2000 that was supposedly based on reporting that research 
failed to include those two crucial pieces of information. The reason 20 million people took Vioxx and many millions, more, many million, similar millions took Celebrex was because of the advertising. It's because consumers saw Dorothy Hamill skating around on their televisions in those Vioxx ads we've all saw, all seen that uh, that so many people took Vioxx. So that's a perfect example of how drug advertising totally skewed what drugs people took and how much they paid. Because Vioxx was many, many more times more expensive than a bottle of ibuprofen, which for most people would have been just as effective. And not only would they not have paid more, they wouldn't have been at heightened risk for heart attacks. And though industry will say the marketing cost don't affect the cost of drugs, they do say the research costs affect the cost of drugs. So. Uh, though I'm not an economist, I don't see how you can have one but not the other. And that, in fact, just like the research costs may affect drug costs, I, I guess that marketing costs probably affect them too. If there's anything in American or Western society that sort of dominates our cultural life, it's advertising. Advertising costs millions of dollars for the Super Bowl for a minute. And the reason it does is because it works. Because by spending a few million dollars on advertising, you make billions of dollars. And the drug industry is very good at advertising. There were many of my own patients that I could not convince that these drugs weren't better. They would come in asking for Vox and Celebrex. And I would say, look, I know as much about this as anyone in the country who's not working in the drug companies. And these are not better drugs. And my patients would say, well, I saw them advertised. Right now, the FDA does not require drug companies to submit television ads or any other drug ads before they air. They only have to submit them after the fact. So the ad will already be on TV or in a magazine. And the FDA, if it eventually gets around to doing something about an ad it considers deceptive, may be too late. I think it's really short-sighted to think that this is a matter of bad drug companies or bad people pulling things over on us. They're doing what they're supposed to do. If we want it to be different, we have to insist on it. And the, way in, the ways in which we insist on it is multi-pronged, but it includes our government. Of course it does. Right now, our government is not terribly interested in making any reforms that would be useful because they're very beholden to the drug companies. If we want to change that, we have to make them beholden to us. We have to have the clout and the influence in the organization to make it that they can't blithely go along making the FDA be something that has been widely and uh, famously called a servant of the drug industry. We have to make it that the FDA is a servant of us. I do believe that ultimately the responsibility lies with the physician who's going to write the prescriptions. And that's why I feel that one of the biggest things we can do, one of the biggest solutions we can provide here is to raise this awareness with physicians and future physicians about the tactics the industry uses to promote their drugs. Now it's a bipartisan issue to restore confidence in our medical knowledge. And unless politicians from both sides of the aisle step up to the plate, it's not going to happen. And that won't happen unless the public demands that their politicians do so.